Hello everybody, my name is Farsan Hafer from ETH Zurich and I wanted to give you a brief overview of an opinion on what is AI for science. I've been thinking about this quite a lot, uh, I've been talking to many friends about this and it culminated in uh, me giving the, the keynote at the HPC plus AI track at Supercomputing in Asia 2025 in Singapore earlier this year and then since I got many questions about this I thought I would record this video that other people could also share it and share their opinions if they actually agree with my uh, statement here. So I want to start with nothing less than an XKCD comic. These are, these are always wonderful and, and it really illustrates what I wanted to say later. So in, in some sense, the credit for this classification goes partially um, to the, the author of XKCD, which you can find um, on, on the XKCD webpage. So in some sense, he, he or she arranges the fields arranged by purity. So going from the very left, the, the least pure fields that are saved, sociologists, psychologists, to the very right mathematicians. So very right, very often uh, math mathematicians may sometimes be a little bit decoupled from reality and they have trouble applying the, the deepest mathematical theories to, to real life, while the sociologists, on the other, uh, other hand, jokingly in this case, have trouble finding the underlying rules, the underlying laws of their knowledge. And of course, all fields are scientific fields. So all of those work more or less empirically, understanding the world, it's just that the mathematicians work in a very clearly axiomatic, uh, a clearly defined axiomatic system where they can always deduce and prove things while other fields have to work more empirically. And then we have the things in between like uh, chemists and physicists who are very well known of sometimes abusing mathematical notation to solve real world problems. And engineers like myself, like computer scientists are also somewhere at the, the physicists level, I would say. So now jokes aside, um, now let's look at this a little bit more uh, fr from, a, from a pragmatic scientific perspective. And as I already mentioned, on the very left side, inspired by this <laughs> comic, maybe, uh, well, it came up independently with a classification that somebody thought it actually would be a wonderful idea to open, um, would be the empirical science, right? So very empirical sciences. And on the right side, there would be theoretical science, like mathematics. So again, sociology, mathematics, you can see. And on the very left side, I would postulate that the knowledge in these empirical science is simply uncompressible. So we, at least we as humans, we cannot easily compress it. So we cannot find basic laws of sociology and psychology. We do not find small equations to represent those. And you can see this if you read at the, if you look at the average article in, in PubMed, for example, 37 million articles, there are very little fundamental laws in there. Most of these are empirical studies about, um, about statistics of certain behaviors, of, of certain reactions to medication or treatments. And so you have to really, really have this huge body of uncompressible knowledge. Well, on the right side, you have a lot of compressible knowledge because if you dive into theoretical sciences, what you will find, you will find fundamental equations. We have these um, 10 to 20 fundamental equations that really drive engineering and development of humanity. And both are equally important because in the medical sector, we do have a lot of empirical experience, how they treat people, how they work, extremely important. On the um, mathematical, theoretical sector, we have these fundamental equations like the Navier-Stokes equation here driving many fluid dynamics, um, pretty much all of fluid dynamics. So here I wanted to give you some examples. I already mentioned it. We could talk about medical di diagnostics in the sense of uh, clinical practice guidelines. So what have people understood on how to treat humans most effectively for certain diseases? And we could also talk about biomechanical analysis, for example, you do fall injury studies, but then you already get some equations in there, some compressible knowledge, because we know how to model impacts between objects. So if you fall, you can actually model the, the falling body. Weather forecasting is another example. We have all the underlying equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, the Eulerian equations. We have, um, the, the, we, we could solve them, but unfortunately for computational reasons, we cannot solve them at the, at the required granularity. So what we do is parametrization, which you could com compare to an uncompressible empirical science again. And then climate prediction is even uh, worse in some fields in, in some sense because weather is only for the next couple of days. In climate prediction, you would need to also consider the change of the earth over many, many decades. So for example, deforestation, desertification, building of cities, human development, big um, um, this human CO2 uh, emission changes, they would all need to be taken into account for longer term climate prediction. These are even less compressible, so they are less modelable by simple equations. So, and then of course, very much to the, to the right on the compressible knowledge side are structural mechanics, because we know extremely accurately how to solve FEM, finite volume, finite element, finite volume methods, and we really understand these things quite well, but at the end, there are always parametrizations to those as well. So in some sense, 
What we try to do in AI for Science is we try to model the world. This is what we do as scientists. We want to understand the world. We want to learn new things about the world. And we learn this by modeling. And now the question is, how can we model the world when it's uncompressible knowledge? So it's kind of an, a conundrum that, that a model is a compression of the world, but now it's uncompressible. So what we usually do there with AI techniques and, and, and ML techniques, we, we improve the capabilities. So we enable humans to build more complex models that they don't have to keep all these details in their heads, but they can outsource those to models that find interest in separating hyperplanes, for example, that reason in spaces that humans usually have trouble with because they're extremely large spaces. And that leads us to a data-driven, fundamentally data-driven representation because it is very empirical, but extremely useful in that field. Now, on the right side, what we would do, we, we know the simulations, we know the underlying equations, but what we can do with AI techniques in order to improve modeling is we can accelerate simulations by approximating these models. Like as I already mentioned, usually the simulations are limited by the computational capabilities of the machines we're running it on or at the cost for the execution, but now AI models promise to increase that sim or to accelerate that simulation or decrease the cost by up to a factor of 1,000 times. And many people have contributed to this, so I've also worked in this field. So 1,000 times is actually realistic. So that is quite nice. I mean, a 1,000 times multiplier in efficiency is great. And then we will enable a faster evaluation of model-driven representations. But AI for science is a whole spectrum. It's somewhere in between every real problem that you want to solve is somewhere in between data-driven and model-driven representations. So let me now go a little bit more into detail. In some sense, as I already mentioned it, on the left side, there would be traditional machine learning and AI techniques, which have been applied to improve the capabilities of these models. This, is, this goes back many, many, many decades because these empirical sciences, they have always been, it has always been mandatory and extremely important to improve the, the handling of this much data that is collected in some automated way. And on the right side, we have largely rely, uh, been relying on traditional modeling and simulation in the high performance computing context, um, but now we are hitting cost boundaries, or now we are hitting new opportunities to overcome the existing cost boundaries. Actually, cost was always an issue for this field. So that's great. And I believe that at the end, AI for science converges both of these fields, traditional machine learning AI to handle empirical insights and traditional modeling and simulation to solve these equations at, at low cost. And at the end, it's culminating in high performance computing because it benefits both sides. On the left, it enables us to work with larger problem sizes. On the right, it enables us to work cheaper and solve these equations to higher accuracy at the end. So these are completely different directions, but they converge in high performance computing in using computers in an efficient way. So let me go a little bit more into detail on the left side, like going back to this PubMed with 37 million articles. So this is actually a very large database of knowledge. And there are many, many benchmarks to, to ask or, or to, to measure the, the quality of, of either a human being or a language model how well you do in, in accessing this knowledge of this database successfully. So there are many benchmarks that you can see here, a list. They're all multiple choice and they're all publicly available. And so this is one of the problems that, that many LLMs have probably, have probably seen them because many LLMs would pass the US medical license exam today. Actually, the success rate of LLMs today in passing these exams is higher than the success rate of humans today in passing this exam. And this is uh, quite, quite interesting, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these LLMs would be better, um, better doctors because they pass an exam. Is, is the exam a good predictor of actual performance? Well, you could argue that this is not because they may just be good test takers, right? Because it's medical, it's largely a, 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 a knowledge field. And we already know that these uh, language models are good test takers, actually great test takers. So here is an example from the GPT-4 paper. And, and without going into too much detail, at the, at the x-axis, these are all different exams, all different knowledge exams, essentially. And on the y-axis, you see here, this is the, the percentile of human test takers. So zero would be you would be the worst human to take the test. 100% you would be the best human to take the test. And here you see that's a, the 50th percentile. And what you can see is for most of those tests, right, so you see these bars, just, just ignore the colors, the, the, the largest one, the green one is the GPT-4 bar. And that's quite a dated uh, example already. It's a very dated example, it's multiple years old. <laughs> but you can already see in that dated example, GPT-4, 4.5, used to be a better test taker than the average human in more than half of the exams that were evaluated. Wow, that's interesting. So, so language models are great test takers, but would you ask it for medical advice? 
uh, because if I ask my doctor for medical advice, I'm not giving my doctor a multiple choice test. So <laughs> is it A, B, and C? Because I want the actual real advice. So now let's put these models to the test for real exams, right? For real uh, scenarios where you where you have a, a, a scenario, like you know, you're presented with certain inputs, like the usual doctor, and you have to generate an, an output. So and and an, 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 a treatment plan basically. So what they did, uh, these researchers. Um, they had 290 resident physicians and 202 um, uh, attending physicians, 61 nurses, and so on, and a language model, proposed uh, treatments and diagnoses, and then evaluated by a human set of people, so by a board, and they graded these exams, basically. So it was not a multiple choice test, it was really case studies. So you, and this is now quite interesting, you can read this paper yourself, I would really um, recommend looking at it, and as the name already suggests, superhuman performance. This is super interesting because in the sense, um, they already point this out, that language models may effectively get just be good test takers and not be good in treatment, so they tested this with, again, pitching real human physicians, resident physicians and, and attending physicians, in case you're not in the field, a resident physician is still in education, an attending physician is then actually uh, fully responsible for, for his or her own uh, decision. And they really performed a series of, of, uh, of, of case studies with physician experts at the end assessing the quality, blindly assessing the quality of the LLMs as well as the human people, uh, the, the, the human test takers. And you can see, this is just a histogram, the, the score here is the higher the better, so from zero to 10 with the language model at the very top, O1 preview performs near perfect. GPT-4 as a good test, the O1 preview is a reasoning model, GPT-4 as a good test taker is reasonably good, but unfortunately both the attending physicians as well as the resident uh, physicians are, are way uh, below the performance of these language models. And interestingly, you also see that basically attending physicians are resident physicians after they finish their education, so there's some more uh, experience in, in inside each of those physicians. You can see statistically they get better. Uh, but you can also see the language models are significantly better. So now that's quite concerning. You could actually go a little bit further and look at a similar test in this paper. And you could now say, well, let's see if we can amend these humans with language models, if, if, if they would be even boosted by the language model. And we see here four plus, and again, a score. This time is the higher the better in the score. If we just use GPT-4 uh, or GPT-01 uh, preview, where we do not have any human involvement, then it is near perfect. GPT-4 is slightly worse. And what is now shocking is that actually physicians uh, make GPT-4 even slightly worse. So if humans use <laughs> the language model, it's actually performing slightly worse. I mean, if, if doctors use the language model, performing slightly worse than if doctors do not use the language model. So in some sense, that's an interesting result. And if you now allow these physicians to use the internet and additional um, books and, and I don't know what exactly was used in that test, then it's also slightly below GPT-4. So GPT-4 is better than using the internet, um, but it's still uh, worse to in conjunction with humans in these human-graded uh, open tests. So that is something to think about, um, but that's really on the very left. So that's improving capabilities. We've seen that AI can really improve the capabilities in these traditional fields. So AI for science is extremely promising in handling big data, complicated problems where we have lots of empirical data and humans use the over, lose the overview of, uh, of, of all that data, which is also clear because our minds are very limited, or at least my mind is very limited. And now on the very right side, where we have these clear equations, I can totally explain this equation. I can write it down. I can create a computer program to solve it extremely accurately. What can we do there? Well, actually, when we have these uh, compressible knowledge, what we could do is predict the weather with, with these equations. And this is what everybody's doing today. Your weather forecast that you're looking at every day is predicted by a computer. And it always had, I mean, well, not always, but since decades, these computer-driven weather forecasts had superhuman performance. So we don't wonder about this at all. This is very natural to us. It's also very natural that a calculator can solve larger number, uh, larger number multiplication faster than I can as a human. So we are already used to this. We are not used to this empirical feel to be superhuman, but, but somehow we accept that in the computational side, this has already been superhuman. Well, not everybody accepts this, by the way, because I'm from Switzerland and we have our Mortitala Wetterschnacker, <laughs> and, and, and they claim to, to have a better forecast, and, and sometimes they're actually even right than the local weather forecasting system. But jokes aside, this field has been driven since a very long time by high-performance computing. Right? And here, what is the opportunity? Because it's already pretty good. The opportunity is to accelerate the field, as I mentioned, 1,000 times as possible, 
and we improve the modeling of effects that are so-called subgrid effects that are not possible to be modeled by the um, by the equations because they would be too small of, a, of an effect. Like if I if I move my hand like this, I would like this example. I may create a hurricane somewhere else that is extremely unlikely that I do so. So the so-called butterfly effect. And in this sense, the AI for science really in this field is also super exciting, equally exciting as the other field, requires to develop new encoders for different modalities. So for example, Graphcast and AIFS uses a GNN graph neural network encoder for climate data. Fushi and Tangu uses transformers and ForecastNet uses a Fourier basis. So there are really many different approaches and there's a lot of potential contributions you could make and then integrate these models into traditional simulation and AI methods because at the end you don't want to throw away all the equations you have. Currently we mostly do this, but it's, it's really un, it, it's somehow it's hard to believe that you wanted to throw away all of these uh, equations and have the model rediscover those, but we shall see in the future. So in some sense, we've now seen both examples, both extremes, and AI for science really converges the two. Both need high performance computing and both benefit from large models and new AI methods. So this is a very, very exciting field that I would encourage all of us to, to participate in. If you're interested, um, uh, let me know. I mean, we're always open for, for visiting uh, postdoc PhD students in, in, my, in my group. And if you're more interested in, in how language models work and the history of those, you could also look at this, uh, this talk here uh, from large language models to reasoning models. But at the end, AI for science is a new upcoming frontier that I would claim is, is extremely important for society. And we would really need to understand and classify what's possible. So I hope this classification that I gave you here helped to, to phrase your thinking a little bit better.